All right. I think we've done plenty of material to get back to our notion of what this section is all about, plane waves, which is part of our scattering series. Um, and I'm really excited about today's lecture because there's just a lot of really beautiful stuff to cover. And I'm just going to go all the way through it, no matter how long the lecture is. But as a reminder, we studied the free Schrodinger wave equation, which can be written in this fashion. And when we solve it, we choose what coordinate system to use. And the Cartesian coordinate system is the one that gives us our literal plane waves. And we've talked about these plane waves in the earlier section when we discussed um, the Hilbert space and the Dirac formalism. And we understand that these plane waves are eigenstates of momentum, which we're using as um, k as a vector here is our notion of momentum. Uh, it's a vector, right? So each possible vector state of momentum, the eigenstate is given by this straight up plane wave. And we understand that these plane waves are not normalizable in the regular sense, right? The normalization is such that uh, this is the normalization. In here is essentially um, uh, psi star psi, where psi is this thing over here, right? And the normalization is this delta function normalization. And that delta function normalization is not, uh, well, you know, that's not the number one. So if that number is not the number one, that means that this is not actually a vector in the so-called Hilbert space, meaning this guy is not a physical state. However, it's um, you can build most, well, you can build all physical states out of plane waves. So we we kind of live through this fiction that it is a physical state, but we understand that literally this means a completely delocalized particle. If a particle is in this state, it could be anywhere in the entire universe. So, you know, it's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, right? This is well-defined momentum, so it is infinitely undefined position. So it's not a physically realizable state, but it's a plane wave, and they loom large in scattering theory. And when we talk about scattering theory soon, uh, or as we proceed through it, we're going to kind of get away from the formalism that is built on plane waves. We're going to kind of always see plane waves creeping into the background, no matter what. And definitely when you get to QED, you really have got to understand and live with these plane waves. They're really critical to the formalism of quantum electrodynamics, and which is why we're, we're studying them so deeply. So I'm going to show some pictures of plane waves later, some graphics stuff uh, later. But understand, you know, from the Dirac formalism, that these are eigenstates. An eigenstate of momentum can be expressed in terms of position eigenstates using the, I guess what we're calling the, you can't overstate its importance rule, right? Where this guy right here, this integral here, like that, that is the identity integral, right? The Yukosi integral, we were calling it. You can't overstate its importance which we derived from, uh, well, we didn't derive, it was, that's what Sakurai stated in his textbook, and we're not, and so we're going to steal it from Sakurai. But once you do that, you know, you end up with this inner product, which also in that section we've explained is actually a dual space mapping designed to imitate an inner product. But we'll just call it an inner product because that is the universal way it's always said in quantum mechanics. And our explanation about it is just some a, a deeper uh, understanding of how this is actually, you know, this is a dual vector and this is a vector and a dual vector is a map that takes vectors to the real numbers. Ergo, this is just a function that takes vectors in the Hilbert space and gives you a real number and that function is called the wave function and there it is, right? So this is our plane wave wave function. I'm going to feel free to call it a wave function even though it is not truly a member of the Hilbert space in a sense. It's not a realizable wave function, but we call it a wave function. It's the free particle wave function, the free particles, the free Schrodinger wave equation. It's free because all you have is the energy and the kinetic, uh, the energy operator. Well, the Hamiltonian has no potential, so it's free. And as soon as we do real scattering, you know, we slip a potential in there and, and everything becomes uh, much more interesting. But anyway, so... Then what we've also done, though, is we realize if we put this into cylindrical coordinates, not cylindrical, spherical coordinates, if we put this into spherical coordinates, we can do this again 
but we end up with eigenstates of angular momentum, angular momentum projection, and energy. So it's still eigenstates of energy, but instead of the three components of momentum that are defined, what you get is the well-defined energy and the well-defined angular momentum and the well-defined projection of that angular momentum. And then again, we just do the same Yokozi principle where we throw in, oops, what do I need to do here? Uh, uh, I forgot my, my measure there, r squared d omega. So we're integrating over all the volume, but this time we're measuring the volume like here, when we did it, the volume was just in Cartesian space, x1, x2, x3. Here, it's r, theta, and phi. And this is the Yukosi operator in that case, right? Integrating over all the volume. And, and now we have this wave function object, which we've solved. And this was much trickier, right? And, but we did finally solve it. We got that radial equation and the angular part of the equation. And so this wave function is i to the lth power times this constant. Um, uh, the spherical Bessel function of the j type, right? The j spherical Bessel function and the uh, spherical harmonic where this here, in case it's not obvious, should be an L, an L. And the spherical harmonic is a function of theta and phi. Sometimes you'll see this written as r hat, right? where r hat is the direction of some radial vector that you're dealing with, right? So in other words, uh, the position in space is defined by, by a direction, just the direction of, of r hat. But the, that direction is fully defined by theta and phi. So sometimes you'll, see an, sometimes you'll see an r hat right in here. But these two, these two ideas, this guy here and this guy here, are you know very similar it's just a different basis it's the same hilbert space but a different basis ergo if this is a complete basis of the hilbert space um these wave functions are wave functions for everything in principle that are part of the hilbert space in other words we should be able to build any member of the Hilbert space out of these wave functions, just like we should be able to build any member of the Hilbert space out of these wave functions. And that leads us to, that's a quick review of where we're at, but now that leads us to this really, really important notion that we'll kick off uh, today's lesson with. And the idea is this, the wave functions and I'd like to keep make sure to keep this Dirac notation firmly in our mind, but we're going to really be talking about these wave functions. The wave functions for the condition where we have well-defined angular momentum and projection and energy, as we just pointed out, uh, are equal to, to, to this for the free particle. A free particle with well-defined angular momentum and energy, this is its wave function. And we're going to look at this thing in tremendous detail. Here I've replaced the theta and phi with a little r, Right, just like I said I would, because I like being flexible with notation, and I want uh, I want anybody who's reading this to be forced to be flexible with their notation, um, even on the fly. Right, I know that's really not typ typically you know you, you don't change it once you're in the middle of it, but I I ch I change it up all the time. Um, so we're going to look at this today. We're going to study these guys in in detail today, or the relevant versions of these 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 characters in, in, in detail. It's going to be really interesting. But this is a complete set of states, right? So any wave function out there should be constructible by an appropriate superposition of these wave functions. In particular, a plane wave, a plane wave should be represented, right? I should be able to write e to the i k dot r as some kind of sum over phi e k. I should be able to, there's some kind of sum. There's a bunch of constants here that depend on, that depend on, hold on. Okay, that's better. This plane wave, or the, you know, should be represented, should be represented by a sum, some kind of sum of these eigenfunctions of angular momentum of free particle with a defined angular momentum 
And the coefficients of that summation, this ALM, should be something we can identify. So we should be able to write these states in terms of these angular momentum states. We should be able to write the plane waves in terms of these free angular momentum eigenstates. Now this is kind of easy to picture, we'll see uh, when we study it. These are not so easy to picture, but it's worth giving it a try, and we will try it today. Uh, notice k is defined. k is just a, a constant here. It's defined. We have a plane wave of a certain energy E, right? And that energy is equivalent to, right, when we write down k, we're, we're basically talking about, even if, if we write down k, we're talking about the energy. It's a well-defined energy uh, through this uh, wave vector k. So k is not uh, part of this summation, right? We just, it's a, it's, Whatever we put in for k on the left, we put in for it on the right. However, we do have to sum over all these l's and m's. In this summation, we've got to figure out what kind of sum we need, what these coefficients are. and But the point is, is that this tells us that a plane wave is expressible in terms of these, uh, well, what, what we call, let's just use the word, partial waves. They call them partial waves. And just to be clear, I mean, there's nothing fractional about them. They're completely legitimate uh, 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 spatial functions, right? They just define where you can find a particle, right? This tells us where, where we can find a particle in space that has a specific angular momentum L, a specific projection M, and a specific energy. This tells us how likely is it to find it, that particle in any particular place in space, given those three numbers. And this, it's very, very difficult to picture how a well-defined angular momentum is going to land in space. This one's not so hard to picture. But it, regardless, whatever picture this is, whatever spatial distribution this function is, this guy here must be expressible in terms of some sum. Now, it turns out that sum is going to require an infinite number of different angular momentums. And for each one of those, it's going to have, we, we presume, some uh, sum over all the projections, right? Because that covers all the states. So what we're going to do first is we're going to derive our analysis. We're going to figure out what this is. And what's really sweet about this is that we're actually going to use a little bit of the asymptotic stuff we learned for JL to figure out what these coefficients are. It's kind of hard to figure out what these coefficients are, but using our asymptotic knowledge of the Bessel function, the spherical Bessel function, we can actually do it. We have to do a slightly a, an additional asymptotic analysis, which will be fun to see, but by the time we're done, we will know what, how to expand these plane waves in these partial waves. And then we'll study these partial waves in detail to sort of get some, I, I want to say intuition, but I hate that word, but we'll get some understanding of what these guys look like in space and see if maybe our brains can, can sort of wrap our heads around this sum. Again, the whole goal being is to take ownership of this thing because scattering theory lives off of this, right? This is the, the, uh, the, the whole core of scattering theory in elementary quantum mechanics. Um, it does show up in QED. Uh, in QED, however, you this in elementary QED, we really live over here. But uh, the, the, the truth of the matter is, is this is absolutely a prerequisite topic. Okay, so our immediate goal is now to calculate what these coefficients are, right? And uh, understanding that the the uh, the rel you know k understanding that k is a constant here, and um, I think uh, yeah k being a constant here, so we got to figure out uh, what 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 part what is the nature of this sum and what are these coefficients and then we have our answer which is the question to which we're seeking an answer is how do we express regular plane waves in uh, in terms of these partial waves. Okay, so let's begin. So the first thing we do is we make a very important assumption. We make the assumption that k dot r, we make the assumption that k is actually some number k times z hat. So we orient our coordinate system so that z is in the direction of propagation. 
And because of that, because of that, we immediately get that this is the magnitude of K times the magnitude of R times cosine of theta, where theta is, right, we have K going in this direction. R is pointing to, R is some vector, well, R is out pointing to the, um, the direction of R, excuse me, the direction of R is pointing in the direction of the field point we're interested in. So, uh, and R has its value R, so, uh, and, and K is KZ, right? So this angle theta is the off of, is the angle between the direction of propagation and the direction to the field point that we're measuring the wave function at, or that we're calculating the wave function at. So k dot r, in this kind of orientation, when we orient our coordinate system in the direction of propagation, ends up being two real numbers times the cosine of theta, where theta is understood to be the, you know, our plane waves are moving in this direction, and theta is understood to be the angle off of this direction of propagation to the field point that we're interested in. I call it a field point. And in, in, uh, this, you know, this is a, a wave function being evaluated at some point. You know, we don't usually think of the wave function as a field, uh, as like a quantum field or an electromagnetic field. The word field is usually not, it's not a wave function field, right? But but the wave function does have a complex value at every point in space-time, so it does have that essence of being like a field. So I guess calling this the field point isn't so bad. But this is the point in space where the wave function is being evaluated. Theta is this angle off of the direction of propagation. So when we do that, we end up with being able to replace what was I vector k dot vector r with just k r cosine theta. Now what's so important about that is when you look at this, you realize there's no phi dependence on the left-hand side. There's no phi dependence at all, which means there can be no phi dependence on this side either, right? And now if we go back to our expression here, right, where does phi dependence come from? How does phi get into this expression, right? This is this guy here is just a constant, so it, it can't be a function of phi. There's no phi's in the spherical Bessel function, but clearly there are, there are um, phi's here in the spherical, uh, the spherical harmonic, right? The spherical harmonic always has an e to the i phi m in it, right? That's one of the parts of the spherical harmonic. So in order for the right-hand side of this, whoops, in order for the right-hand side of our expression, right, in order for this expression to have no phi dependence, right, uh, the only way is if m is equal to zero. So m must be zero because the sum, I mean, this is a sum, right? So you're going to get a term with minus, you're going to get you know, a term that looks like e to the minus i phi l will be one extreme of the sum. It'll be the lower extreme. You'll have a, a term that's e to the i phi l. There's no cancellation, right? These You're going to add these things up. They're not going to cancel. The only way to get rid of it is to make sure that the only thing in this sum that we include is m equals zero. And that's what we've done down here right? We've gotten rid of that sum. We've replaced m by zero. And now uh, we have a much simpler expression. First of all, we only have one sum, the sum over all angular momentums. And as far as we know, there may be some restriction there. There isn't, actually. But uh, we definitely got rid of, oh, and we got rid of the m dependence of our coefficient, right? Your coefficient can't depend on m either, right? So I guess there is some dependence of, of m in principle there was, but now we know this side can't depend on m at all. So we replace the uh, spherical harmonic with the numbers with uh, zero, and we get rid of the uh, indication that the coefficient's dependent on m. All right, so now uh, what do we do next? Well, we know that this spherical harmonic when m equals zero is actually equal to this, right? This is just a spherical harmonic property. 
right? It's, it's the associated Legendre polynomial meal with n equal to zero, which by the way, happens to equal, right? This thing happens to equal the regular Legendre polynomial with n equal to zero. And notice how, um, and, and uh, r, right, which is uh, r hat, which is equivalent to theta and phi. Well, there's no phi term anymore because the, uh, well, the r, uh, r hat still depends on phi, but this spherical harmonic depends on r hat, but only on the theta part of r hat. So uh, this relationship here goes right into this cosine theta. So the connection between the spherical harmonic of theta and phi and the associated Legendre polynomial um, without the right there. So there's now it's e to the i zero uh, phi, right? So that just goes away. And you're left with, uh, and this zero means that uh, it's still the associated Legendre polynomial, but the associated Legendre polynomial when m is zero is just the regular Legendre polynomial. So that's all cool. And, um, and nothing changes about J and um, now this can only depend on the magnitude of, well, why did I switch that? Hold on. Yeah, I think, I think it's probably wrong for me to put the magnet uh, or the unit vector K, K hat, right, is the direction of propagation. K as a vector or boldface in the LaTeX typing, LaTeX typing, um, is the actual vector. And I think this should just be the actual vector. C could depend on, on, on K, right? But um, so I think this replacement's legit, right? Now we have the magnitude of, of K only. And so what do I do? Um, okay, so now, now what we do is we exploit the fact that these are orthogonal polynomials, right? They have an orthogonality relationship, and this is the orthogonality relationship, um, which is kind of interesting because if you understand that the variable is cosine theta, so this is d cosine theta. So you could do a quick substitution, right? You could write w equals cosine theta, in which case you would have pl of w, pl prime of w, dw, right? That would be okay. But the point is, is that orthogonal polynomial, this is a known fact about Legendre polynomials and their orthogonality relations. So this is something you have to pull out of your toolkit, understanding these special functions. You Basically, with special functions, you know that there's always an orthogonality relation. That's one of the things you, you know exists. There's integral representations, which we spend a lot of time about talking about, but there's also orthogonality relations. And this is it for the Legendre polynomials. And uh, this is the answer. But notice you got this nice delta function, L, L prime delta function. So if I take this and I integrate on both sides with uh, another Legendre polynomial, I can kind of start exploiting that integral. So let's do it. So integrating on the left, minus 1 to 1 with a Legendre polynomial, gives me this tricky thing. The integral of a Legendre polynomial with e to the i k r cosine theta, d cos theta, which I'll just say, you know, you got W, you, W, W. Actually, W is not, I don't think I use W. I think eventually when we do this, we use S. I, I use S and S, right? So this would be uh, PL of some ver real variable S. S is real, right? This is not a complex uh, uh, representation or, or a complex integral of any kind. This is just a real integral. I'm just showing you that. Don't, get, don't let this cosine theta thing throw you off. Uh, it, it did for me. That's the reason I harp on this is whenever I harp on something, it's because it, somewhere in my past, the problem existed. And, and, and I had, to, you know, this is not elementary calculus to have d cosine theta, but it's just a way of writing a substitution that's implied here. And that substitution that's implied is something like s equals cos theta, right? Okay, so that aside, so we do, so this integral is unknown. The reason we're doing this integral is because on the right-hand side, right, we, we integrate from zero to minus one to one of cos theta, d cos theta, and now the integrand is this thing. But nothing here, nothing here depends on cosine theta. This sum doesn't depend on cosine theta. 
or I mean, I'm sorry, CL doesn't depend on cosinus theta, JL doesn't depend on cos theta, uh, this doesn't depend on cos theta. So we can basically swap the integration and the sum, and when we do that, then we, you can kind of see it, right? This part here, which is unaffected by the integral. Actually, we don't have to swap anything, right? We just, we just, um, uh, you know, sort of move this over to here so we can kind of see this structure better. And then we replace that integral with 2 over L, L plus 1, right? And, uh, and then start to simplify. So, so let's see, how does this work? This integral here, this, this integration, which I'm trying to sort of capture. Uh, hold on, let me see if I can capture it better. This integration here, right? Right. That gives you 2 over LL plus 1. This part doesn't participate in the integration. So when you take, when you take this and combine it with that, you end up with, well, you end up with this expression here. The delta function, delta L, L prime, uh, that's really, really important because uh, because the summation ends up with a delta L, L prime in it, which gets rid of the entire sum, right? And it just turns L prime into L, and so you end up with this expression right here for the right-hand side. The integral's gone because it was intended, and we designed it that way, and the sum is gone. So you can kind of see we're zeroing in on what we're after, right? We're zeroing in on CL here, right? We've now got this really bizarre integral on the left, and we've got CL on the right. So we could solve this for CL if we could solve this integral. So... Um, I'm going to write it down this way, but I'm going to move this thing from the right side to the left, and then I have this expression here equals CL times this Bessel function, right? Uh, which is just a nice way to write it. I mean, I could have divided through by the Bessel function, and we would have had an expression for CL. The problem is, is we're staring at this integral here, which looks kind of hard. It's a Legendre integral of an arbitrary order multiplied by e to the i k r cosine theta d cos theta. Hmm. So it turns out this integral can be done. Uh, not easy, and it's fun to do uh, if you can look up how to do it. Every time you have a chance to do a new integral, you should grab it. However, we are going to exploit what we've already studied just to see how useful it can be, right? So for example, the asymptotic form of this Bessel function, right, is very useful in this case because this is this is an equal sign. So the asymptotic form of this, of the right-hand side, really should equal the asymptotic form of the left-hand side. Now, what do I mean by asymptotic form? Well, this guy here is a function only of r. The only variable left, right, is r. So the asymptotic form means what is the value of this thing when r gets very, very large? Well, the left-hand side, you integrate over d cos theta. So again, the, and k is, a, k is a chosen constant. So again, r is the only variable that will be left over after this integral is done. So the left-hand side is also a function of r, and we can ask, well, what happens to it when r goes to infinity? And if I can calculate the asymptotic form of the left side, I know the asymptotic form of the right side. The CL is not dependent on R, so it's just some constant that's not going to change. But I know that the JL has an asymptotic form. And if I do what I need to do to set these two asymptotic forms equal, well, the way to do it is manipulate CL so the two asymptotic forms are the same. And that's just sort of a quick way to do this without having to evaluate the integral except the dirty little secret of this method is I need to figure out what is the asymptotic form of this integral. And that brings you into a whole new subject of asymptotic analysis. To do this, we used the saddle point method of asymptotic analysis, which is one technique. There's a whole branch of studying of, of there's a whole branch of asymptotic analysis that's done 
that, that exists for the purpose of finding the asymptotic values for definite integrals. And the saddle point method isn't relevant. Right? We had a contour representation, a, a complex uh, contour representation for the spherical Bessel function. Ergo, we could use the saddle point method. But that's not what this is. This is just a real integral. And real integrals have its own set of techniques. And fortunately, the, the most basic technique is really easy. It's just integration by parts over and over again. And we'll see. We're going to do that on this. To, and we'll see why it gives us an asymptotic series. All right. So let's do that. Okay. So this is the integral we're after right here. Right? So we make that substitution I was talking about before where, D cosine, where cosine theta becomes s. So this is our actual integral that we're worried about. And what we're going to do is integration by parts a couple times, and we're going to see how this is, that is an asymptotic expansion, basically. Um, we're going to see how there's a, a term that goes as 1 over r, and then the rest goes as 1 over r squared. Anyway, so if we integrate this by parts, the uh, rubric I remember is integral of u dv equals uv minus the integral of v du. So I guess v is going to be e to the i krs, right? This is what we're going to call v. So, uh, or, or actually, that's what we're going to call dv, right? And so we have to integrate that, and we end up with this expression. So there's our 1 over r in this boundary term of the integration by parts. And then um, uh, this and this together make V again. And now this is uh, DU, right? Because P is U. So anyway, uh, the point is we get uh, everything there is now 1 over KR. And uh, I can simplify. Let's see. So let's do the next step. So we simplify this boundary term. And we get uh, the Legendre polynomial evaluate at 1, which is always 1. And then is Legendre polynomial at minus 1, uh, which turns out, it turns out that that's going to end up being I, uh, I to the L, right? Whatever that is, L is, I to the L is what PL minus 1 is, right? So, but we'll see that in a moment. So we, we're starting to simplify the boundary term. And, but we're going to integrate this by parts again. So we already have 1 over kr, and then we have another 1 over kr from the next boundary term, which drags out a derivative of pl, right? So we've got another, another kr drops out, and then that other integral also has uh, another kr that drops out. Actually, uh, actually it drops, hold on, I got a little bit of an error here, right? That 2 doesn't belong. Right? Here's one factor of r to the minus 1, and then they, both of the terms inside the next integration by parts brings out another factor of r minus 1. So we end up with, let's see, uh, this PL1, that's just 1. This PL of minus 1, that becomes minus 1 to the L. And here's the 1 over kr, and that lands right here, 1 over kr. Now we combine these two, and uh, that square shouldn't be there. We combine these two and this, and we combine this with this to get this 1 over kr squared, right? And then we have a bunch of stuff in the brackets, right? So it turns out we don't care about the stuff in the brackets because that's his order of r squared, and this leading term is of order of r. So that is an asymptotic expansion because as r goes to infinity, all of this stuff, meaning all of this stuff, who cares what it is? It's going to disappear a lot faster than this front, than this first term, right? Than this term. This term here, well, let me draw it. This term here is going to survive, and all of this stuff is going to go away. And so we call that um, uh, uh, order, r, order r minus 2, and so that's gone. And then it's just a matter of like, okay, well, what is this, right? So we're going to just chop this up a little bit. We're going to pull out a factor of e to the i pi over 2 L, which is just i to the L, right? 
And that's going to leave us with kr minus pi over 2l and minus i, kr minus pi over 2l. So this obviously becomes the sine, right? All of this here becomes the sine of kr minus pi l over 2. And this leading factor, right, this, this for example, this i in the denominator lands here. This 2 forces us to put a 2 upstairs. And then this guy here becomes i to the l. Because e to the i pi over 2 l is i to the l, like I just said. So we have 2 i to the l over kr sine kr minus pi over 2 l. Phew. And we know that that has to equal, or as, so that is the asymptotic form of this integral, right? So when r is very large, right, this integral, whatever its value, is going to end up being this number right down here, right? So uh, this is the asymptotic form of the integral we seek. Actually, I think I write, wrote that down again. So here's, here's the expression we're after, right? Here's where the integral we just dealt with the asymptotic form of. We know the asymptotic form of this. That is sine kr minus pi over l over 2 kr. And now we know the asymptotic form of the left-hand side, right? We just figured out the asymptotic form of that is this part right here. So we have this factor, we have this factor, and we have CL. So we just tune CL so that the left-hand side and the right-hand side are the same, and voila, we get 2 i to the L pi 2L plus 1, square root of 2L plus 1. Ergo, ta-da, we're done. E to the i cosine theta is, here, there's our coefficient, and there's our expression here. I should probably get rid of that zero at this point, right? It's just a regular Legendre polynomial. And that is, that is how you do it. That is how you get this plane wave to look like, to be expressed as an infinite sum of waves of well-defined angular momentum. Uh, although, um, admittedly, we need to combine a, a, a few things here, don't we? Uh, we need to combine this and this. Why didn't I do that? Hold on. Okay, that's better. I, I, I needed to combine these constants, right? So that's the famous expression that we're after, right? Uh, notice the spherical harmonic is kind of gone here, right? This plane wave has just driven that spherical harmonic into its little core piece of the uh, Legendre polynomial. So this is the answer you typically see, but notice we've already established it for one coordinate system, that is, in the direction of propagation, aligned where the z-axis is aligned in the direction of propagation of the vector k. So f for completeness's sake, there is this famous relationship between the Legendre polynomial of cosine theta, which is k dot r, and we're now these are direction. These are unit vectors, and the unit vector in direction k, unit vector in the direction r, that dot product is the cosine of the angle between them, right? So this is obviously connected. But this expression, called the addition theorem for spherical harmonics, is, is something you just got to know, right? I mean, it's part of that canon of mathematical physics. But it's something you got to know only so you can, say, convert this thing back into its most general form. And so sometimes you see plane waves broken up into this kind of language. And that's just one application away of, uh, of, of the addition formula. That is, I, I basically replace PL cosine theta, right? I replace this with this sum, and you end up reintroducing this double sum that you, we eliminated earlier. But that's for an arbitrary alignment of the z-axis with the direction of propagation. So the first thing you ever do is you almost always just drive it right into this form. Anyway, so now we are left in this great position where we have our plane wave interpreted in terms of partial waves. Each one of these terms is a partial wave. So now we're gonna spend some time with the rest of the lesson is visualizing these guys using um, Mathematica. So I'm going to switch over to uh, a different method of recording, and we're going to go through a Mathematica notebook where I actually plot these up, and we kind of see how this infinite sum 
of things that are only dependent on R. I mean, this is very spherical. Theta definitely defines an axis, right? Because theta is off of our axis of propagation K, right? The unit vector K at least. And so there is a favorite axis here, but there's no phi and everything is in terms otherwise of R. So there's something very spherical about the right-hand side, um, but there's clearly nothing very spherical about the left-hand side. Those are just plane wave. That's a plane wave. So we have to study what does this guy look like and how does it get constructed out of an infinite number of these guys. All right, so that's our next step. All right, so we'll begin by looking at just the plane wave itself, right? This idea, this, we're looking at purely the e to the i k r uh, cosine theta, and where r cosine theta equals z, and our z-axis is in the direction from uh, left to right, with right being positive. And what I've plotted here is the real part uh, of a plane wave where I've set the value of k, the actual plane wave is given as e to the i k z. Remember z is r cosine theta. I set k to the value 1, so everything's in terms of de Broglie wavelength, and uh, we plotted the contour plot of just the real part. Obviously, if we plotted the magnitude of, the, of this plane wave, we'd get 1 everywhere. We'll talk about why that is in a moment, but this is just the real part. The complex part, or the imaginary part, is just shifted by 90 degrees based on uh, just this exponential, cosine kz plus i sine kz. So the idea is that the flux of the particles is definite momentum k, uh, or wave number k, and it's going from left to right. And because the magnitude of this function, of this complex valued function, is equal everywhere, right, remember, you're only looking at the oscillations of the real part. But when you find the magnitude of the full real and complex part, this would all just be one color. It'd be the number one everywhere, right? So the probability of finding the particle at any spot is equal no matter where you look. Now I've only plotted this from 50 to 50 squared de Broglie wavelengths, which is not a lot uh, considering the size of the universe, right? So if you're exactly at the momentum k, then, uh, you know, by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you are going to be equally likely to be anywhere. So uh, this is a this is a this is why a plane wave is simply not part of the Hilbert space. It's just too vast and it's too precise. However, uh, this is what we work with, um, and the point is is that this plane wave is something that we have to construct from these partial waves, these angular momentum definite partial waves. There's no definite angular momentum. If you're in this plane wave state, assuming you could be, or some approximation of it, you, there's no definite angular momentum. There's definite linear momentum in the x, y, and z direction. And for this particular version, there's zero momentum in x. Uh, x, is, by the way, would be coming kind of out of the plane. Y is up and down, and uh, z is left to right. In fact, that's an important point. The y-axis is up and down, and the z is left to right. Theta would be the angle of, from between this axis and whatever field point you're evaluating. So if I was evaluating the field point right there, I would, the origin being in the middle, theta would be this angle here, right, between this x-axis and the field point. So um, uh, we have to construct this thing out of these partial waves. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to look at, let's just look at each individual partial wave first. Let's get an understanding of what does this guy look like, right? We see a, a Bessel function that only depends on r, which would be the distance from the origin in this case, right? r is just the distance from the origin, in this case in the xy plane. Remember, nothing depends on, on phi. Right, so whatever we get, whatever whatever value we get here, we just rotate it sort of like a, a, 
uh, volume of revolution, right? A, uh, in the uh, uh, around the z-axis, right? So, uh, so we have the spherical Bessel function of order l and this Legendre polynomial of order l. And these two things come together; they multiply in complex and beautiful ways that we're going to look at now. But somehow this adds up. All of these weird functions on the right add up in this beautiful way, if you add up enough of them, to give you this structure. So the structure we're seeing right here, this real part of the plane wave, should be the real part of some elaborate sum uh, of these partial waves. Now notice PL cosine theta, that's a real number. The Bessel function of a real quantity, that's real. 2L plus 1 is real. So the only imaginary piece is i to the l. So if l is even, then this whole thing is going to be real. If l is odd, this whole thing is going to be complex. So uh, uh, imaginary. Uh, so we have each term is real, starts out real, imaginary, real, imaginary, l equals 0, 1, 2, 3. The even ones are real and the odd ones are uh, pure imaginary, which is kind of interesting because this is a blend of of both. So clearly you need uh, a sum of these to at least give you a real and imaginary part together. Okay, so let's look at some of these individually now and then, uh, then we'll look at some summed up together. Alright, so let's start at the beginning, right? What the, We're now looking at this is an image of the partial wave of the L equals zero partial wave. It is the only of all the partial waves, it's the only one that is going to actually have a non-zero value at the origin. Because remember the Legendre polynomial, right? This Legendre polynomial for L, uh, I'm sorry, the spherical Bessel function for L equals zero actually has a value at the origin. All the rest of them do not. So you see this beautiful peak in the middle and then it slopes on down and this cross section, if you could slice it, would look just like the spherical Bessel function of order zero. And in fact, we can rotate this on its side. And what you should see is this stru structure here, this angle here, this drop, is the same as the spherical Bessel function of order zero. You see? Now, there's a little bit of an obscurity here because what you're seeing is. It doesn't look like that sort of damp sinusoid because we're seeing the, uh, when we look at it edge on, we're kind of seeing some of this curvature. But if you've got this beautiful cross section, and we'll see that in a moment, uh, this black line that's flowing, that's an exact capture of the spherical Bessel function of order zero. And what's also important is that the uh, Legendre polynomial of order zero is just a constant. So the uh, this is the direction of propagation, right? The direction of propagation is from right to left, and the Legendre polynomial is just a constant. And when theta equals zero, we're along the z-axis. When theta equals ninety degrees, we're along the y-axis. And what the z-axis here is just a representation of the magnitude of the function. The z the spatial uh, I'm sorry, not the z. The z-axis is the propagation axis. Y is perpendicular to that. The x-axis, which is coming up here, is just being used in this as a representation of the magnitude of the real part of the wave function, which is the only part in the case of the uh, the l equals zero term. But the the spatial wave function also has an x-axis that's captured as a just as a volume of revolution around the z-axis. But um, uh, uh, you, d but theta equals zero is in the direction of propagation. Theta equals 90, uh, 90 degrees or pi over two would be in this direction. But you'll notice that the, the Legendre polynomial is constant, so it's not even a function of theta anymore for l equals zero. So you don't see any nodes. You don't see any suppression here. To get this. Uh, you see a little roughness in the calculation here, but that's only because uh, my plot points is only set to 150, and it's relatively complex. If I set this higher, it'd be even smoother. We'll see that in a moment. 
But let's look at a different one. Let's look at, this is the L equals, let's see which one is this. This is, this is the, must be the L equals two version, right? Let's take a quick look. No, this is L equals one. So when L equals one, you are now dealing with the Bessel function, spherical Bessel function of order one. So it is zero at the origin. And sure enough, you can see in the direction of propagation, it starts at zero and then peaks real fast, and then it slopes off. And if we turn this um, on its side a little bit, it, it, this, is, this is a really huge file, that's why it's so sluggish. But if you turn on its slide, you can see there is it. there it is. That's the spherical Bessel function. And the reason we see it so well in the z-direction is because the Legendre polynomial in the uh, in the theta equals zero direction is has a value of one, so there's no suppression. On the other hand, at 90 degrees, it's completely suppressed, right? Uh, the reason you got this white line in here is an artifact of the, of the fact I had to use an arctan function. And uh, Mathematica is smart enough to know to not even try to plot it at the 90 degree line. But um, so you do get a node, and the node is at pi over 2, right? The node is at pi over 2. And uh, uh, so that's the L equals 1. Uh, version of this. Look how gorgeous that is. Now to get this really good picture, to get it to look that good, I really had to turn up. If you try this yourself with Mathematica, make sure you turn up the value of plot points. I made it some ridiculous value, like a thousand. I guess I was experimenting, but a thousand made a difference. It you know, it improved. It was better than two hundred, right? So, so, uh, so there you have it. Uh, so now let's look at another partial wave. This one is the partial wave. Well, we can, I don't even need to go up there. I can tell you it's the partial wave by counting the number of nodes, right? There's one node, right? So this is uh, one node, two nodes within pi to pi over two, right? So, uh, and then you can see again, if I can turn it on its side, you can see that there's this spherical Bessel function feature right here. And you can see it's not suppressed along the ax axis of propagation, but here's a node. A, a new node is introduced for this next partial wave. And uh, what a beautiful thing, right? This is really, really magnificent. Um, uh, let me go back up a little higher here so we can just keep looking at partial waves because who wouldn't want to keep looking at partial waves? I, they're just amazing. So now we're going to look at um, a more dramatic partial wave. We're going to look at the partial wave of order 10, right? So this is uh, L equals 10, the partial wave of L equals 10. Now what are we seeing? Well, first of all, we see a lot more nodes. In fact, we see 10 nodes. But we also see that the center is now being cleared out, right? If we were to rotate this a little bit, right? We rotate this on its side. We see that the entire thing is suppressed in the middle. Well, why is that? Well, the reason is, is remember, this, this uh, function is the product of the spherical Bessel function and the Legendre polynomial of, where the Legendre polynomial is taking this cosine theta argument and the spherical Bessel function is just taking a just purely radial argument. So the spherical Bessel function in this case starts at zero and stays at zero for a while until it pops up. Actually, I think it pops down, yeah. So it pops down and then up and then oscillates. And that oscillation, right, if you look at it on its side, um, that you can now begin to see from these peaks, that is the one over R suppression of the oscillations, but the actual nodes that kill it off in the angle is from this uh, Legendre polynomial. And so let's have a quick look at, this is the Legendre polynomial, right? And when the Legendre polynomial has an argument of one, which means theta equals zero, because cosine of zero is one, and so the Legendre polynomial, right, 
the, the, the genre polynomial is taking a cosine theta argument. So when theta is 0, cosine theta is 1. And that value, boom, it's 1. So it, it doesn't suppress anything uh, along the theta equals 0 axis. But then um, it immediately, there is a node right here where it does kill everything off right away. And it's a very, it, it's a node that's very close to the theta equals zero axis. It's not very far away. So sh we should be able to see that if we looked at this uh, from the top. And you know, sure enough, that first node is right there. It's not very far away from the axis. And then we should see another node, and that should not be very far away either. And indeed, that's this node right here. So we've seen those two nodes. And then there's a bigger gap, a, a bigger angle. Well, a bigger gap in cosine. It's nonlinear, so it's a little bit hard to predict how big these gaps are going to be. But you can tell that there's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 nodes between 0, cosine of theta is 0, and negative 1. And that's effectively. Uh, you know, it would be from here to here, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten nodes. And there they are. Look how pretty that is. Now, what about this thing in the middle? Well, that is an artifact of the fact that by the time you get to j equals ten, you actually have some pretty significant suppression of the spherical Bessel function near the origin. And that plateau there translates immediately to this clearing out of the center of this function. Um, this function is not plotted with quite the same level. You start seeing some choppiness in here from Mathematica right in here. Um, I don't know if that's, it's, it's not quite as visible. It's pretty bad actually. But this little choppiness is from, uh, uh, you'll notice I only have plot points of 200 here. So uh, I, 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 what you, would, you would get a lot more consistency uh, in these remoter regions if my plot points was, was a little bit higher. I should have plotted that one a little bit tighter. Um, let's go back to, this one is the uh, the genre, uh, the spherical, the spherical, the partial wave of L equals 1, which we already kind of looked at a little bit. But here you can see that um, that first node, I have these Legendre polynomials. The Legendre polynomial is a straight line, so you expect one node when cosine of theta equals zero. So at pi over two, you expect a node. And sure enough, if you look at this, there's a node at pi over two. Again, that white line is an artifact of, uh, of an arc tangent I had to use to convert my coordinates. And then the spherical Bessel function, however, is zero in the middle, but it's, it, it doesn't have a lot of suppression in the center like it does for L equals 10. So you're expecting this first peak to shoot up very close to the center, and sure enough, relatively, relative to the, everything's close compared to de Broglie wavelengths, right? This is all measured in units of de Broglie wavelengths. And um, uh, just do that again here so you could see it. And now here we do it for the, uh, we do it for the second partial wave. For the second partial wave, the Legendre function is a parabola. It has two nodes. The spherical Bessel function is kind of looking the same like it did for j equals 1, but there's a little bit of suppression being introduced in the beginning. Not much. Not, not so much that you would notice. And now you, begin, now you see the nodes that are induced by the um, uh, Legendre polynomials, two, two nodes. right? And again, you have no suppression whatsoever in the uh, z direction, right? The z direction is always going to be 1. Whenever cosine theta is 0, PL, uh, the, the uh, Legendre function is always going to be 1. So you'll, you'll, never have any, you'll never have a node in the forward direction. OK, so um, uh, that was L equals 2. Do I have another one here? Uh, this one is uh, for L equals 3. And now you see the, the Legendre polynomial for L equals 3. And you see um, the Bessel function. Again, a little bit more suppression, but not a lot. When you see j equals get around 10, you really see suppression actually out to about 10. Uh, it was approximately 10 um, de Broglie wavelengths. 
But here it's at three, it's more like, I don't know, two, four, six, eight, more like one De Broglie wavelength. Uh, and you start seeing all three of these nodes. No node, an anti-node really, at uh, theta equals zero. And then you see this first node shows up when cosine of theta, something like three quarters, right? And that's reflected by these two nodes here. And then you get another node when cosine theta equals zero, which of course is at pi over two, which is this node right here. And it starts chopping up these little peaks in the middle. And let's see, what else have I done? Uh, okay, so that's all for the individual partial wave. So we looked at L equals three partial wave. Now the funny thing is you add these things up in the right way, and you better get a plane wave, right? So now let's study some partial sums of this form. We studied the individual summands for L equals zero, one, two, three, and 10. <laughs> so let's look at some partial sums and watch them add up to give us a plane wave. That's what we're gonna do next. Okay, so let's start with uh, this picture here, right? Um, L equals zero to three, right? This, the upper partial, partial sum is just the first four terms, L equals zero to three. You know the L equals zero term is in there because you have a non-zero value in the middle. I really wish this, I, I could somehow deal with this white line, but I guess we're stuck with it. Um, and what's really wonderful about this is you can see these wave fronts in the Z direction already building up, right? Especially right here, right? Those, those little three blobs there are asymmetrical uh, in the circular, in the, um, in the uh, I guess it would be the uh, longitudinal type direction, right? This is the direction of propagation and you already start seeing these waves just propagating uh, in the forward direction and being suppressed in the transverse direction. So you're seeing this buildup of plane waves. Now in the end, you're expecting this whole thing to just be a bunch of plane waves, right? But these nodes are, the nodes of these first uh, four partial waves, I guess the nodes of, the, of L equals one, two, and three, because the L equals zero had no nodes, are kind of, are beginning to, to add up to cancel a lot uh, of the of the uh, of the value of this wave function that that is uh, parallel to the direction of motion, which is this way. So what we're expecting is, as we add more partial waves, we're expecting to see more and more straight uh, crests and troughs that are actually perpendicular to the direction of motion. So it starts looking more and more like partial waves. It's really quite uh, quite a beautiful thing here. So let's see what happens if we uh, add some more. I think that would be going down. Um, in this case, oh, this is just another view of the same thing. If you if you put it on its side, you start kind of getting a sense uh, uh, of the of the wave. This is these are the plane waves. These are going to become the plane waves. Um, now I did it all the way up to L equals 30, right? Right, so now I'm really pushing the numbers. And boy, look at that, when L equals 30, I've, I've oriented it so now the direction of propagation is like this, uh, uh, is, from, uh, is from, from the lower left to the upper right, right? And look, you start seeing these plane waves are literally forming right in front of your eyes. They're even flat. Now, the farther you get, uh, away from them, the more, uh, the farther you get away from the origin, the more the plane waves start becoming a little bit erratic. They still are parallel, but they're not uniform in magnitude, right? Which is kind of interesting. So the way to interpret this is, this is the probability amplitude for finding a particle in the ZY plane um, uh, that has an angular momentum between zero and 30. And it's just harder for that particle to exist 50 or I guess 25 de Broglie wavelengths from the origin transverse to the origin and have the momentum K. Remember K, the momentum, the energy of the particle is, 
is well-defined here, right? We have a well-defined energy, and we're now adding up angular momentum. So these are ill-defined angular momentums because this is now a superposition, right? This That's what this is here. This is a superposition of angular momentum eigenstates. So this partial sum from L equals zero to 30 doesn't have a well-defined angular momentum. But whatever angular momentum it does have, it's between zero and 30 because there's only 30 terms in this sum. It has to be one of them. If you measured the angular momentum precisely, only one of them would emerge. But it's, it's difficult for that particle to be found if you were to measure its position it would be difficult for that particle to have that angular momentum and be out far away from the origin transversely. Not as difficult to be uh, far away from the origin in the direction of propagation because uh, you could always cut back your angular momentum no matter what your energy is by getting tighter and tighter to the center. That's why I think these peaks appear here in the middle. I'm just interpreting it as best I can. It's always a pseudo classical interpretation when you struggle with that kind of thing. So then um, uh, uh, that was 30. So here's five, some intermediate case. It's more than four, but less than five. And you really, this is, I think, probably the most illustrative of how this process is unfolding, right? You know, these nodes are really accumulating to suppress things and you start really seeing these waves form, and now it's just a, a, a matter of straightening these waves out, straightening these waves out. Um, and so that's for the first five partial waves, right? If you add up the first five, zero to five, so I guess that's the first six, right? Um, yeah, that's really, that's, this is really, uh, really, really beautiful. I mean, you're really beginning to see, you still have a lot of irregularity in the shape of the crests, but these two in the middle, they're pretty flat, right? Those are pretty flat crests and it's strangely peaked. And then they kind of become flat again, but they get more curvy too. Um, so in order to straighten these things out and make, so in order to straighten out these crests, level the tops of the crests and make them bigger, you just need more angular momentum eigenstates. You just need to keep adding them up. And in fact, if you add up the first 100 angular momentum eigenstates, look what you get. Ta-da! You get this beautiful, um, perfectly uh, arranged um, set of plane waves, right? It, 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 within the range that I'm plotting here. Now, if you increase this plot range, you know, this stuff would break down. They, they would become less and less level and they would become more and more uh, curved. Um, and it would be, and then it would go into a region where it would be very unlikely to find it. So this isn't, this doesn't go out to infinity just because it's a hundred, but a hundred is a lot of, that's a lot more angular momentum. And it's, it's more than enough angular momentum to make perfect plane waves within 50 de Broglie wavelengths of our, um, of our uh, origin. So, so there you have it. That's the method of visualizing these partial sums adding up into uh, plane waves. And this subject of plane waves is really, really important because when you understand plane waves and you realize that, yeah, the wave is definitely going in one direction, but it could be anywhere. You know, if you're a particle that's being hit by another particle who's in a plane wave state, you could be, uh, uh, you know, hit from the left or hit from the right. You know, you could give up uh, a photon to this field or, or accept one from this field. And uh, you could be kicked in both directions because you don't know what side these particles are on. We'll talk more about that. You know, when we actually discuss uh, uh, the actual uh, QED fields, the, the electromagnetic, or, well, we, we actually discuss the electron field, so let's not worry about that, or the photons um, and the plane waves of the photons. But uh, this structure here, this plane wave, now we, we've got it. We now can see, we can see this thing being built up literally by this. Uh, just make no mistake about, you know, it's, it's everything you saw is a representation just of the z y plane probabilities 
and uh, you still have to rotate it as sort of a, a, a volume of, of revolution around the z-axis to capture the xyz spatial position. And so all of the vertical stuff you're seeing here, remember, is just a reflection of the amplitude of the wave function. It's a way of viewing the wave function. So yeah, it's really worth bending your mind around to visualize, okay, wait a minute, what does this mean? This is the direction of propagation. This is the spatial direction, perpendicular direction of propagation. So this is a plane. I'm looking at the probability of just one slice of space. And this vertical direction, that's just an expression of the amplitude of the wave function to help me interpret the probability of finding something in this plane. So obviously we need extra dimensions to sort of picture it all throughout space or maybe colors or something. Okay, anyway, I really, really enjoyed this, uh, this lesson because I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm very proud of the Mathematica stuff I did. Um, it, look, it wasn't the hardest stuff in the world. Mathematica makes it easy, but uh, uh, it did take a little thought to put it all together and interpret it the way, the way uh, I wanted it to show. Anyway, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. And um, now we will move into uh, formal scattering theory. And um, uh, maybe we'll, do, we'll, we'll take an advantage. We'll, we'll do a quick thing on partial wave analysis of collision theory and um, uh, uh, the, uh, the scattering phase shifts. And then we will do uh, the formalism of scattering that is absolutely necessary for QED. So I'll see you next time.